Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. As you saw in part one, we looked at this board. This is a 500 Rev 6A. All I did in that first part there was pretty much reassemble this because it had lots of missing components. So we've got a full set, you know, full complement of the Mega chip set here. We fitted a missing resistor here. It was a bit large, but I've got some smaller ones which we can fit in, uh, you know, a future part. I haven't recapped this board yet. That might be something that needs to be done. Anyway, I'm not going to discuss this board too much. We'll come back to this probably in part three. But this is the board I want to look at in this video. You can see this is from a 500 plus. You can see the battery area here, you know, suffered the typical uh, corrosion damage and someone's had a tinker trying to fix this. There's some fixed wires here, lots of broken traces. This looks a mess around here. Seriously, that needs redoing. But it's got a broken uh, socket here, as you can see. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a, pin, a few pins missing in that corner there. Uh, there might not be, it's just the socket. So we'll need to replace that socket. Somebody has socketed up these, but you know what? I see little bits of wire here and solder, so I have no confidence at all that the work around there is correct. I will remove these. I might re refit in the same sockets because there's nothing actually wrong with the sockets, but I'm going to remove them so that we can clean up and inspect and just work out what, if anything, is damaged around there. One or two of these sockets might have uh, a bad pin. I don't you can see that. It's looking a bit greeny there so again we're going to be removing perhaps that socket that socket maybe these sockets um what we can do and this is a tip that retro game mods uh, did and i've done it myself actually many years ago when i was in the trade is you can remove a socket that pin there you could you know you can push it out it will come out they just push fit through the actual plastic housing there and maybe take this socket off borrow a pin fix this socket, put that socket back on. So I might be able to say, you know, refit all, th say those three, and just use the pin, some of the spare pins from this one to make sure you've got good pins. It's uh, just a way of saving uh, sockets, really. But again, the reason why some of these sockets are gonna have to come off, see here, there's a little wire, a wire. So somebody's removed some of these, and again, you know, there's wires here, look, wire, wire, wire. It's a state, I don't envisage this being an easy repair at all. There's gonna be a lot to do on this. Um, including obviously you know fixing the original battery corrosion damage here but again like the previous video here there are no chips on this at all so I'll have to uh, dive into my spares uh, collection again I don't think I've got another full set but I do have some Agnuses it's going to be a different Agnus on this one this 500 plus I think to the previous board there um, I've got a couple more Amiga 500s uh, coming on the way. And that was the reason why I stopped part one, because I haven't got access to a keyboard. I mean, I've got some floppy drives, but then I'm lacking the cables and things to connect the floppy drive up. Um, I really need a keyboard and floppy drive to be able to test that first board uh, properly. Um, and obviously I'm gonna need the same thing for this. I can't get access to mine, they're in the loft at the moment. And the other thing to point out with this one, all the electrolytics are missing. I think someone was planned maybe to recap or they've used the capacitors off this to fix something else. Look, they're all gone. So it needs a full complement of capacitors as well. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by um, removing some of these sockets. Uh, I might start with the data path and then we'll move on to these and maybe do the Agnes. And just looking on the underside, you can see I think this has been reflowed. You can see the work on the data path here. That looks crusty as anything. And look at this. Oh my goodness. That is going to be a nightmare. That's going to be a nightmare, that. Uh, and again, just under where the battery area here is, yeah, it's not looking great at all. So throughout this series, I'm just going to randomly do sort of jump cuts to different subjects, just to cover some of the things to do with these systems and diagnosing faults, etc. Um, and just tools and techniques and things like that. So in a previous video, I showed that some of these have got like little circular holes underneath the uh, Fat Agnes chip there. Um, and you can obviously just push, you know, with using a, some sort of flat tool, a flat implement from the underside of the PCB to get the chip out. But the best way, is, as I said in the previous video, is a PLCC extractor. PLCC stands for Plastic Leaded Chip Carrier, you know, so you've got like the, the connections, the leads around the side of it, you know, they're around the side of the chip and the contacts around the side of the socket. Um, so you push the PLCC uh, connections, you know, the prongs here, down. Uh, and then you very carefully squeeze and lift. You see that? You've got to be careful. Lift one way and then the other, and then the chip will come out. So, yeah, no damage 
to the chip or the pins and stuff. And as I explained in the previous video, you know, you'll have a pin one marking on the board, you'll have a notch there, you've got a slanted edge there, a slanted edge on the socket. So, you know, if you're replacing the socket, make sure you get your socket the right way with respect to that slanted edge and pin one. Uh, and make sure you get the notch on the correct side there. And just, uh, you know, press PLCC chip in like that. So in terms of dip chips, you can get a dip extractor. Um, now this is a dip extractor, but it's a super cheap one. So for small chips like these, it's pretty easy. You know, you can just literally just squeeze the contacts at the other prongs in on either side and gradually lift one way and the other. And as you can see, the chip is out. Wear an ESD wrist strap. Uh, I've not got one on just now. I'll show you that in a sec. Wear an ESD wrist strap when handling these chips and handling the PCB. Um, you know, you'll see carpet in a lot of my videos, certainly my older Amiga videos, I think I just did the board straight on the floor. At the time, you know, I knew the risks and I just kind of just went for it, I knew there wouldn't be a problem. But you can get a problem, this is the thing. You've got to take ESD uh, seriously, especially with uh, anything that's a valuable old kit. Because you can't get replaced, well you can get some replacement for some of these chips, but they're not going to last forever and you don't really want to be damaging them with ESD. But the problem with uh, something like this, you know, it's a cheap tool, you know, you, you can see you've got to bend it, I'd have to bend it out, so maybe for the ROM I might just be able to squeeze it up there and get it out, but more often than not it'll slip off on one side, 68,000, no chance of getting that on there. And a similar story with some of these 48 pin dip chips here, you know, it's, it's so long and they're really stiff in these uh, dual wipe sockets. That's the other point to make is boards like this 500 plus here, well it's not 500 plus, it's just a later revision of 500 this one, you've got um, dual wipe sockets. So what that means is you've got two sides to the contact, I'll see if I can show you that, I'll zoom in and I'll show you the difference. So apologies it's wobbling a little bit, but what you can see here, if you look at, uh, you know, you've got metal contact there, metal wiper, and on the other side, another metal contact, and the pin goes in between the two, so that's dual wipe. On the very early boards, you'll see they've got single wipe sockets, as I'll show you in a sec. Um, so it could be preferable to swap those out for dual wipe sockets. If you wanted, you know, reliability, you can get what's called chip creep, where the chips slide out. I've talked about it many times, and you just press the chips down when you first get a system, you know, just to make sure the chips are all firmly in. Um, but you'll have to do that a lot less on uh, systems like boards like this, where you've got dual wipe sockets. The chips are really, really, really stiff in these sockets. And I can show you, let's say, a removal technique here. You just use the screwdriver here, just very carefully, just to get under the edge on each side. You don't want to leave it too much at once, because otherwise you'll bend the pins on either side of the chip. But you can just use, you know, a flat screwdriver or something, so that's out. Yeah, and I think you can see the difference here. Can you see here, you've, you've got the contact here, but on this side, it's just a solid plastic edge. There doesn't appear to be, so I think this is a single um, white one. This isn't, you know, hasn't got a connection on this side. So, you know, the, the pin is held between the plastic outer edge and this spring-loaded sort of contact here, you know, and obviously with removal and insertion, it can, it can get slack and stuff. So that's, uh, you know, something to uh, think about. So, just heating up the uh, desolder station there. I'll pull the temperature down a bit, doesn't need to be quite that high. I think we'll go for uh, around 400. I think it might be a bit less than that. 350 might be a better temperature to go with, but nevertheless, yeah, I'll let that heat up. And we'll have a go at desoldering these four sockets here. I should probably have a smaller tip on the desolder station here because, yeah, you can see there, as I'm desoldering one, I'm sort of heating up the other. But yeah, the solder's coming away. Well, surprisingly, that came off okay. Got no, uh, you know, connections or trace or pads or anything attached to the socket there. Um, it doesn't look too bad, but obviously, you know, some damage has occurred to this because you can see, you know, there's a bit of a bodge stuck there, and there's one here, uh, there's one there. On this side here, the blobs of solder were just holding the pins. There's no pad. You know, those you can see those have been burnt off at some previous point in time. Um, that's going to cause an interesting problem with the solder flowing from the other side. So I might have to put a turn pin here actually uh, for this one, I'm not sure. I won't do them all like that, just where I need to. You know, these two might be alright, although I don't know, I don't know. Can you see there? Look, look at that. Got a bodge there as well. You can see the solder's coming off really easy with this 
the solar station here. So there we go, that's those uh, two rows there done. So we just get the uh, pliers here, just grab two or three at once and pivot like that. Don't scratch the PCB. The idea here is just to snap them off the edge, it helps snap them off the edge. And I found that this is the easiest way to do it. Back in the day, I was shown by other engineers to push the pins with a screwdriver. Um, in fact, the socket's gone already, it's come off there. <laughs> There's no pins here. That shows you how uh, the solder had been pretty much removed already because it's just hanging off. Yeah, can you see that? Look. Yeah. There we go. It's come off. Uh, so you can see... Is that one of the pins? Let's have a look. No, that's that wire that was bodged. You could see it a minute ago when I showed you. There's a bit of solder on the side of it, so someone's obviously... Uh, I don't know what they've done there. Used a bit of an old leg or something, I think, to try and join up to a trace here. Well, that's just not the right way of doing it. The right way of doing it is to follow that trace, you know, clean this up now, yeah, follow the trace where it's damaged and work out where it goes. And it's gonna to go to one of the pins on this chip here. Draw a diagram to show which pin number needs a wire to which pin number on here. And then after you fit the sockets, just solder a wire underneath from the pin to the pin. That's the best way of doing it. Never try to join, you know, from things like this on the top side, on the traces. It's just really fiddly, really messy. You know, it's like that here. You know, what, if you can avoid it, try and avoid doing this sort of thing. But I mean, this might be all right because you've got vias. We've got a via and you've got a connection or a via and a via, you know. Yeah, you can go from via to via that way. But I would personally, you know, do some connectivity tests on the other side of the board to see w where some of these traces go. It might be pin connections here. It might be connections around here. It might be somewhere around here. And a solder, instead of the wires here, solder from wherever to wherever. Because ultimately, some of these here will perhaps go to connections on here. So, you know, you could have... Uh, 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 wire that way if that makes sense anyway i'll just remove these two we'll remove that little bit of whatever that is there and i'll uh, give you some macros clean it all up and give you some macros and we'll just work out what needs to be done now this board was originally donated from uh, anthony over at riot retro gaming and i'll be honest when i first saw this board yeah, that one's going to need a bit more solder when i first saw this board i was kind of of the opinion it was only going to be useful for spares well one of the few spares that are actually left on it because there's just so much work going to be required to do this but my views change because it's for 500 plus and there are the 500 plus is becoming an endangered species really because because of the batteries you know there are very few um i think decent ones out there so if i can save this one it will be uh, it will be good it'll be good if we can save this board yeah, you can see, where you get a point like that, you know, you can see that's like the ground of the VCC, there's a massive trace here. You need extra heat, extra time for it to pass through to the other side. Um, it's just not, it's just not flowing. I could increase the temperature on the station here, but I think if we just give it more time, it'll be all right. Yeah, that's not too bad. So, we can just do the other ones now, start back over this side, I think. See, something like that, come off that easy. And we're not pressing down heavily here, you've just got to just be light on the pad there, otherwise you will pull the pad off. But you can see, it is coming off. Yeah, that's not too bad, so let's uh, see if we can free that one up. Yeah, that one's come off as well, I think, I can feel it pushing through already. I'm not even finished uh, moving the things there. I'll show you what I mean, actually. Uh, you can see, look how loose that is. Just in this uh, corner here where we had the uh, problem with the connection. You can see it's connected to this large trace here. So I'll just give it a little bit of a lift. I think it might come out. Yeah, there we go. No damage. Socket's okay, as you can see. We've got no pads or through holes, you know, uh, connected to it. So... And you can see actually that one's not too bad. The connections here look okay, so we didn't need to take that off, but you know, it's, it's a good idea. When you've got this amount of damage, it's a good idea. So you can see this one's okay. Got a bit of solder that needs removing from the top side there before we can get the socket on. Same here, you know, wherever you get like a ground, uh, that's the VC, uh, hang on. 
yeah, VCCs up here, grounds down here. So those are the ground connections. Wherever you get a ground connection, you'll always find you get a massive amount of solder still there, and that can hinder you when you're trying to get a socket on. So, yeah, get a little bit of flux on there, or use your desolder station, you know, and uh, use a bit of solder braid or something to remove that. But we can, we can do that. Um, so yeah, this area here, I'm going to need to. Cl I'll clean up these with a the fiberglass pen here again. You know, they've been cleaned, you know, scratched with a fiberglass pen already, but it looks a bit dark and awful. So I'll go over that with a fiberglass pen again, just inspect them all, and then tin them with some solder and flux. I'll show you that. You can see whoever removed the chips here to put sockets on the lost the capacitor and the same here so we need a couple of uh, bypass caps there probably something like i don't know 0 0.33 microfarad or something like that i'll check the service manual to see what size it should have so you can see these are the bodgers you know there's like a bit of wire or something there uh, i've got some solder there needs removing um yeah these need cleaning up from this side you've got a bodge there look to a trace these like i say we've replaced with wires those same here, look this bodgy wire thing joining something up there, I don't know, so I'll clean all those off, clean up the contacts. So not mega exciting, but somebody's bound to say I wish you'd shown me uh, cleaning up some of the top of this, you know. So we're just going to heat with solder here, just try and, there you go, get that, can you see that little bit? It's come off there, we'll just uh, get rid of that. And there's a bit here, so again just heat that. There we go, another bit of wire out of the way. I thought there was another one or two. Uh, yeah, we've got some solder there that needs removing. I think that's the bodgers. Oh, hang on, there's one here as well. Got a bit of a wire there, look, I think. It's hard to tell what that is. Yeah, it's definitely a wire. Unless it's the trace that's been lifted and someone's folded it up. I don't know, I can't see what that is. This distance here. Might have just been a bit of solder there you go. It... Yeah, it's gone now. But the next thing I'll do is get some flux on here and use my desolder braid and have just a little uh, uh, slide around with the desolder braid. Yeah, so I'll show you what I mean. I'll just cut the end off the desolder braid there, get a fresh bit. Got some uh, chip quick flux there and uh, I'm just gonna just go over the tops of these actually just because it's going to aid getting the socket on there and it's going to assist us, like that one's got a missing pad hasn't it on that side I think that was where the wire was it's just going to assist us seeing what's going on as well and make it look nice and clean and tidy the bit of solder that's on the braid there can you see I'm just going to slide it up and down that trace there to tin it it just means it's not exposed um, you know bare copper there you go just give that another go there you go um, but if we do this, like I say, it's going to be easier to tell what's damaged and what isn't. There's a wire there, I can see it. Yeah, someone stuck a wire through the hole, look, there it is. Can't get it out, it's in the actual hole. Oh. I hate it when that type of repair has been done. I can move it around, I just can't get it out the damn hole. There we go, it's out. Yeah, it just just gets in the way when you do that sort of thing. There's another one there. Yeah, there's another wire here. Look, you can see it there, floating around. Have I got rid of it? No, it's still there. Look, it's still in the hole. There you go. It's come off. Yeah, these aren't traces that I'm removing here. It's just a wire that someone stuck to try and bridge. You know uh, where it's been. Where it's you know that let's say the pad there's missing. These are going to come off, I'm not too worried if I touch those wires and melt them, because they're going to come off. Let's just reflow that wire if we can. Yeah, it's not too bad. So uh, I'll just do the top of this one. I think the bottom side of that one's okay. Got one there that I need to check. You can see the trace is now tinned, but 
It's just a question of whether there's a break there or not. We'll just get rid of that solder at that corner there as well. Like I say, we're killing two birds with one stone with this. We're making it easy to fit the socket and cleaning up at the same time. So I'll show you this before I forget. I haven't done anything with a fiberglass pen here as I said I was going to do because the traces are pretty exposed here. I'm just uh, turning them up like this. I perhaps will go over with fiberglass if there's any bits where it's not. I feel like it needs exposing and it's not. For example, that first connection there, I don't think you can see it, looks like it needs scratching off to me and, and tinning over. Um, but yeah, let's, let's just do this, get this out of the way and then this whole area is done. Yeah, there's a gap there that might need scratching off with a fiberglass pen. Or it might need a fixed wire, that's the thing, it might be a piece of the trace is actually gone. Let's get some more flux onto that. I think these components here I would take off and uh, at least reflow as well actually because the ends there you know where the, they join the board are not great. Let's uh, just tin that bit there up. This is where you can need additional heat, in fact I've joined that up, can you see that? Yeah, I've joined that to the PCB because it's uh, the ground I think. Um, so yeah you need additional heat when you're doing that sort of thing. You can of course lose traces and pads and things as well doing this, that's one thing. To be careful of but that's looking a lot better it's just a few here to do and there's one there but I'm gonna need the fiberglass pen onto those before I can uh, solder onto them properly I think so before we do anything else let's uh, use cotton bud with some IPA here and just clean this area up and let's have a really good inspection I'll put you on macro so you can see how it looks now before we finish it you gotta be careful because you could easily snag something you know and create more damage you know like pull a pad off so Got to go gently to start with until you know you know you get a feeling of how much pressure you can put on a specific area that you're cleaning here. Right, let's use the other side of the cotton bud with some more IPA. Yeah, as we get down here, these are okay. These bottom two chips can pretty much go straight back on. There's no damage to either of those there actually. That one there's alright as well actually I think. The interesting thing is one or two of the things that look to have been patched you know, with little wires, they actually look okay. <laughs> it looks like there's no damage there so I'm not quite sure what happened there actually. But, I mean this area was not fully cleaned up to start with you know whoever fitted these sockets you need to go you've got to go to this level you've got to get it super 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 clean you want the uh, corrosion bits to look shiny and you want uh, you know no remnants of any dark areas and things like that you know if you've got dark traces like these here these need tinning you've got a problem there you've got corrosion surface corrosion there but ultimately it's gonna if it's not causing a, a, a failure there in those connections you're gonna get a failure at some point yeah, so this bottom chip here, I think it looks okay. I need to measure on continuity, you know, because I think that was one, was one that was bodged, wasn't it? I had a bit of wire. But it looks, I don't know, it looks like it's joining, but it could have a disconnect there. So that might be why that had that there. But as I say, you can just trace that up here. I can't see it now. Follow it up here, and you see it goes here. So just have a wire on the underside of this socket here to there. That's the nice, clean, easy way of doing that. One or two of these had bodges, like this one here, so maybe that trace is gone. I mean, it looks like it has, but it might just be that this needs exposing here. I don't know. Or has it gone? Can't tell. But that's, that's the what I'll need to do now is go over these and go, is that a trace? Oh, that is actually it's copper, I think. Yeah, and if it is, just tin it up and then just test on continuity. I think that trace is all right, actually. But again, you could, you know, if there was a break here, you just need to do a diagram, draw all these dots, you know, the vias here on the diagram as well, you know, when you pin one mark and so, you know, just replicate this whole area in a drawing. And you know that if the trace here was broken, you just need a wire on the underside of the socket to this vias here. Um, well, presumably that's where it goes, I can't quite see. Again, you can see a dark area there. That needs scratching off and turning up and testing with, you know, connectivity. I can't see if that's coming off or not. But anyway, that is what I need to do now is focus on any of the, the dark bits. Let's see if there's any more. Yeah, see there's a bit here where it doesn't, you can't tell whether it joins there or not. So again, that needs scratching back 
and uh, tinning up. Yeah, I can't really see what's going on there. So we've got one suit here that I mentioned, you know, that again, that trace could have gone as it. I don't know, it looks like it's cleaning up, can you see? So I just need to tin that. Um, I would do the one on the inside here as well. There are a few bits here, look, that are black. They need scratching off, and that just needs tinning up. Same here, I think. Looks like it was a break, but I don't think it is. I think we've got copper underneath, it's just corroded. Yeah, anyway, it's going to take me some time to do this, but you get the idea. It really is that simple. And then just get some, you know, clean it off with the IPA, get the uh, flux on there, and drag the, the solder braid with a tiny, tiny bit of solder on it to turn it. Anyway, you get the idea. So as I continue work on this area, I'm just going to use some white vinegar here. It's distilled white vinegar. So, yeah, I mean, this will have been cleaned up previously with uh, vinegar, I'm sure. I don't know what state this board was in when it got to Anthony. I think someone else had had a go at trying to fix it. But I've got no doubts Anthony will have cleaned up with white vinegar, which is why the corrosion's not got much worse. Um, you know, white vinegar's an acid. The batteries on these, the Varta one that goes there, is alkaline. So the white vinegar will neutralize acid, but you do need to then clean the acid off. It's an interesting one, because I've, I've always wondered whether <laughs> it's a good idea to use uh, acid at all, actually. Because if you don't clean that off, acid can do just as much damage as alkaline. But you know, it's essential, you can see actually it's cleaned up the traces there that were looking very black. Um, I might be able to get a bit of a better bite with the solder when I get some flux on there in a minute. You can see I've been scratching off some of the bits of uh, contaminated uh, areas up here, you know. There's still more to do, there's a black trace there that needs the surface removing, but these are all going to have to be tinned up. There's a bit here as well that needs more work, just there. But I'll then clean over that with IPA again. So when it comes to the VCC and ground points, in fact that's still red hot, um, when they get blocked, as this one was here, just crank up your soldering iron or your solder station to you know a higher temperature. I had to go up to 480 and hold it on there for about 20 seconds before it would desolder that. Um, so as you can see, and I'll give you a macro in a minute, we've covered most of the traces here. There's the other little particle of copper exposed, but we can cover over this with some nail polish later. Um, there are a few things I'm worried about, you know, we've got like a really bad connection here to the VCC pin on this one, can you see that? It's like half the pad's missing, we've got uh, half a pad missing here, you know, which is why where one or two of these had uh, fixed wires on, I think there's another one here that had a fixed wire on. So I'm going to measure on connectivity test on my multimeter next and just work out which of these pins here between these two chips are broken. These two chips could just go back on effectively, you know, the sockets. Um, I see no damage around there, I've inspected super closely, so those two are fine, it's just these two, which is, I guess is a consequence of being so near the battery area here. Um, I haven't finished cleaning up up here yet, you know, there's still a bit more work to do. I'm going to get these two sockets back on here actually, just as a break to do something different. There was melted plastic on this side of this socket here, and I've just, you know, s s used the knife here just to level that off. It's still a little bit there now actually, just be careful just try and level it down because I don't see any point in replacing these sockets they are brand new sockets you know it's just got a bit of an imperfection can you see that from the plastic there but that'll be okay um, so let's we'll get that the right way around uh, make sure it goes through yeah it does so I'm gonna have to unblock that hole in a minute I'll show you I'll bump it up to 480 to unblock that one but yeah that's that socket on I've, I haven't, let's say, inspected. The, the traces here are all fine. No, no issues at all. The corrosion hasn't got that, that far. It did get to this pin here, and that's something that's quite typical with these. Wherever you've got a ground connection on chips, you can find the corroded. I've seen these with 500 uh, plus batteries, where the ground pin, I don't know where it is on these, it might be that one up there, which is why that's got a bit of corrosion. You, you tend to see the ground pins on all the chips. Even the Denise gets corroded, wherever that is, I'm not sure. Um, so that's something to be careful of. You can think that the corrosion is just here, but it's like I say, it, it can turn into a vapour, and the ground pins on chips right on the other side of the board can be affected by it. So, you know, do inspect further afield than just the area you're dealing with. So you've seen this stuff a million times before. I'm having to hold the socket. You could bend the pins over to hold it in position, but, you know, the corner pins, but that's just asking for trouble. When you, if you ever have to come take the socket off, 
yeah so I'm just gonna just try and just get a bit of solder on there like that I will reflow it properly in a minute it's just trying to do it one-handed as I hold the thing in place again a bit there that's it I'll just flip it over inspect it and then I'll reflow it properly yeah as you can see that socket is in position the pin one notch is on the side there you know correctly so I'll just uh, I might just straighten it a bit can you see that's not quite straight I don't know how well you can see that it's kind of tilting down a bit here even though it's flat with the board you know it's you can adjust them like that so if I just heat this pin and just move it up a little bit it'll straighten it out yeah I'll show you I'm putting some pressure on the uh, thing from the other side if I just heat that pin uh, I'll do this one actually let's try and pull it down a little bit yeah as you can see that's now nice and straight so I'll just carefully solder each of the points there so the solder station set to 480 and I'm having to use 480 as I say because it just absorbs so much heat on these ground and VCC connections this hole here is proving impossible to desolder from the other side so I'm just going to get some crazy amount of solder on there. Yeah, I'm going to get some on the pin next to it. I'm not worried about that. And uh, if you just give it... Oh, it's come off there straight away. I was going to say, sometimes you've got to give it 20 or 30 seconds. But yeah, in that case, with that extra heat, hang on, it unblocked super easily. But prior to that, even at 420, 430, it was not unblocking. I was holding it on there for like 30 seconds and it wouldn't pass the heat to the other side so I can pull the heat down again now to around the 400 mark and as I said at the start 400 is a bit high but you know what I haven't lost any pads it's all a question of just not heating too long but you do need to heat long on the ones that have got these massive you know you can see here this massive piece of copper here on both sides of the board You've got to remember there could be an original fault with this and what I mean by an original fault the RAM could be the issue actually it might have bad RAM and that might be why this has ended up in the state it has because you know typically when people got a fault with these something that a lot of people did is just stuck them into the loft you know one day I'll get it fixed or one day somebody will be uh, see some value in it as it is with the faults you know not knowing that there's going to be another fault and then someone would try and bodge fix it and create more faults <laughs> So I appreciate this is a different board than we're covering in this particular video, but there are some similarities. I think JP2 is, has got the same behaviour actually between many of the boards there. I could be wrong, but I think it has from memory. Um, so you've got two positions that this solder blob can be in. You know, it can be between the first pin and the second pin, or the second pin and the third pin. You can see on this board, um, I've had to move it uh, downwards there. And I think we had to do that on the previous uh, video, actually, on the previous board. Both the jumpers were incorrect. JP7A or whatever it is near the expansion slot and it needed moving across. This particular one here, I think one side is A19 and the other one is A23, you know, address lines that come from the CPU there. And depending on how those are set, dictates where the extra RAM, um, you know, expansion RAM sits. So in the position it is here, I think actually it's gonna the, the expansion would be uh, classed as s slow RAM. Anything that goes in the expansion slot over here is not actually fast RAM. I think it gets registered as fast RAM on the dash on the dashboard of uh, wor uh, Workbench there. When you boot Workbench up, I'm pretty sure you've got chip and fast as the two things on the top there. I might be wrong. It might be chip and other. I'm not sure. But so yeah, RAM that goes in here is actually classed as slow RAM. But when A19 is set, I'm not sure what position that's going to be, probably the other position, I think. The um, expansion RAM would be uh, sat at uh, 0800000, I think, which is the second half meg of chip RAM. Bear in mind, you would need an Agnes that can uh, access uh, a meg of chip. Uh, this is a good example of one, an 8372A. In the other position, it sits at C00000, which is the slow RAM. So you do need to adjust that if you want to use, you know, a, a half a meg expansion and maybe, I don't know, trick the system into using that as chip RAM, for example. But from memory, I think you also need to, you might need to adjust uh, JP7A on some boards as well. You know, there might be another jumper. Uh, I'll perhaps come back to that later. So the expansion connector here, there are a number of uses for this. The most 
recent bit of kit you can get to utilize that is the ACA 500 plus from individual computers so if you're aware of individual computers they've produced various accelerators for the Amiga um, namely the 1200 and the 600 but the ACA 500 plus is a, a, a module that plugs into here and it gives you a 1200 expansion connector so you could plug in a 1200 accelerator into the this system you know, and get maybe an 030 or an 020, etc. But it also has a um, compact flash uh, interface on there, you know, an IDE interface, I should say, really, and you can plug a, uh, a compact flash card in. These co compact flash cards use the same ATA interface that IDE uh, did back in the day, you know. Uh, and something like that would provide a lot more RAM as well. You know, you might have 64 meg of RAM or 128 meg of RAM or something, and that would be all fast RAM. The other thing you could plug into here is in terms of official Commodore products, the only two that I'm aware of, there's the A590, which is a hard disk drive sidecar, you know, so that's a big module that just plugs onto the side and mates with the expansion connector there. And that gives you a hard disk, um, but it also, uh, I think, allowed 2 meg of fast RAM. Uh, and I'm guessing, because it's on this connection here, it would be true fast RAM. So when we talked about uh, the fast RAM and the expansion slot on the right-hand side, the memory uh, slot over there, in the previous video, that's classed as slow RAM. It's a mistake I always make, uh, you know, and the reason being is because, like I say, I think if you go into uh, Workbench and you look at how much RAM you've got on a system like this, you know, where you've not changed the jumpers and things, you might find that it says half a mega chip and half a mega fast, I think. I could be wrong. Um, we can perhaps confirm that later, I'll boot Workbench on one of these. Um, yeah, so it can confuse you into thinking that's fast RAM. It's kind of, I think they call it pseudo fast RAM. So it's not really fast RAM, it's slow RAM. And the reason it's slow RAM is because the, it's, a, it's, um, it's because it, you need to access it via Agnes. You know, so it's not direct, you know, it's not like the CPU you can just access it all the time whenever it wants. It has to go via Agnes, uh, that's why it's classed as slow RAM. But RAM that is wired onto the, uh, you know, the data and address bus connections here of the CPU, they're direct to the CPU, they're not controlled or run through uh, Agnes, you know, so uh, the CPU doesn't have to make requests and wait states for, you know, waiting for various things in the system to gain access to RAM that's on this side of the, exp you know, the expansion connector here. And th this expansion connector, and this is where my knowledge gets a bit fuzzy, it's classed, it's classed as Zorro. You've got all the connections there to, uh, you know, have a female to a female, and then you could, in theory, plug a Zorro uh, expansion card in. Uh, now, I'm not sure if Zorro 1 originally ever existed, or is this what Zorro 1 was? Because you've also got Zorro 2. Now, Zorro 2 is 24-bit. Well, it just so happens that this is 24-bit. In terms of, its, you know, address lines here, it's got 24, it's capable of 24-bit addressing. But on the more modern CPUs, like an O2, and an 030 that uh, address limit goes up on like an 030 for example you got a 32 bit and that's where Zorro 3 came into use so basically the different uh, types of Zorro there dictate how much address space you've got to play with you know so in terms of like RAM expansions and any other kind of peripheral or expansion you might want to connect to uh, I don't know a 2000 or 3000 or 4000 or 500 you know you're dictated by your CPU and how much address um, you know how many address lines that CPU has but before we forget, the nice thing with Zorro, it was ahead of its time. It was kind of like a predecessor to plug and play. So if you remember plug and play in PCs, you know, when you can start to get PCI cards where, you know, you plugged a card in and it automatically allocated resources within the system, you know, it would set the ARQ and the base address and, you know, uh, all that sort of stuff. So, and, you know, DMA channels and things. So you could literally just plug a card, you know, a sound card into a modern PC and uh, Windows, you know, would automatically configure figure it or the BIOS would or whatever and you wouldn't have any clashes and things there and everything would be happy it would just be automatically detected plug and you know hence the name plug and play and Zorro provides a, a kind of a, like a plug and play type interface they call it auto config and I think the way that works is when the system's booting I think peripherals can read from a particular register they can write to that register and cards get polled to identify themselves so I'm guessing that you know the CPU is going to run some code and it can start polling the devices connected to the Zorro um, slot here and each one of them is going to read from register right to that register 
to, to identify itself it's going to write a number of uh, you know bits uh, in the register there you know uh, individual bits to identify you know to set certain identifiers say I'm a memory card maybe use a few different bits there I don't know several bits to identify the size of the memory but that was way ahead of its time PCI came out a long time later I'm sure I'm sure it was more than five years uh, later I mean if you think about when the original A1000 came out PCI was uh, a long time after that and the other obvious change between, say, Zorro 2 and Zorro 3 is Zorro 3 is faster. You know, you get a faster throughput on the interface. It runs at a faster clock speed, as far as I understand. And whilst researching some of the stuff to do with that, to make sure I didn't miss anything that was of interest, it, I read an article that said it's maybe 60% as fast as the original PCI. So considering, you know, how early this technology was, compared to something like PCI, the fact it was 60% as fast as it, it was pretty blooming good, really. So only the quick correction to the previous video, and it was something blatantly obvious that I just, you know, I was rushing through it when I was looking at the schematics and I was like, oh yeah, okay, I see lots of uh, connections, you know, the individual colours coming through to here. One of the things I then said about the hybrid is, I wonder, I wonder if it was an afterthought, you know, because, uh, you know, it's, um, it's a bit unusual to mount something like that here, you know, in this position on the board, and I wondered if it was an afterthought and they were tidying up the video signals, and that's obviously not the case because looking back at those schematics and just thinking about things you've got the red green and blue you know the individual bits that make the red green and blue channels up going to these two four uh fives here i think the two four fives um oh the two four fours i forget um this is going to be the dac it's going to be a dac you've got a digital and you need analog signals going out um so yeah this is the video dac effectively when we talked about 64 colours in uh, hand mode, that's not the case at all. The 64 colours comes in the half bright mode. So when you used hold and modify the hand mode, you could have, I think, up to 4096 colours. So yeah, that's a small correction, but thanks to whoever uh, posted that. Correction to the previous video, I can't remember where, at some point, I think I referred to Kickstart as Workbench. You know, it's, I always get the two mixed up. It's like, I know exactly what they are, I just, my brain just tangles things up and I say the wrong thing at the wrong time. Now if I'm honest, this is going to be the worst part of this repair. Um, Gary, I think it is here, because just look, you know, we've got pad, 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 about several pads missing on that side and some of them are just barely hanging on. So with a bit of heat here, you know, we could lose the odd pad. For that reason, I've turned the heat down a little bit. Yeah, so this half a pad there. Anyway, I'm not going to bore you with all of this. I'll just show you what it looks like after I've got it off there. Yeah, so this is going to be a pain to get off because you can see like we've got a pad missing, 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 missing. About six, six or seven pads there. One here missing. One there missing. Half a pad. I don't know, half a pad. So, uh, hmm. the big problem is when you get that, is the, the, the solder's not going to flow through to this side so it can be super hard to get these off I think this one I am going to destroy I can always just pull the pins out and reuse the pins for one of the other sockets because I might yet remove this CIA socket and I can borrow one of the pins from that for that do you know what I mean use this as a pin uh, sacrificial socket if you see what I'm trying to say uh, so I think the way I'm going to do that you know this is another technique you can do is just chop the socket up so we'll split it into chunks of three or four, just use the cutters very carefully, like that. Bear in mind I've soldered majority of the pin, desoldered majority of the pins here. Yeah, carefully, carefully, just snip it up into little chunks. You can, if you're not careful, damage the PCB doing this, but if you're careful, you won't get any additional damage to it. I mean, you can see there where the pins, uh, yeah, one or two of these are almost hanging off, where the pins have uh, been desoldered f fully from the other side. Just snap that little bar in the middle there. We'll do that one as well. Yeah, so in chunks like this. But you do want to remove as much solder as you can before you do this, because the stress of doing this could actually create some more damage, but yeah, we should be okay. We're getting there now. 
so the thing that makes it easy now is you know you can grab one of the chunks, that one's just fallen out, you can see the chunks just fallen out. You can grab the little chunks from underneath and if you feel one stuck you can just heat the pins, there's another one, you can heat the pins from the other side, let's see if we can find one that's stuck and that one's come out as well. That one's out, that one's out. Yeah, you can see most of it you can see I desoldered. This might be where the pins are missing on the other side. In fact, it is, I think. No, it's not. Um, but you can then just uh, heat, you know, find those uh, three or four pins. Where are they? Are these ones here. It's that fourth one I think is holding it. Yeah, just heat it from the other side as you wiggle it. That one's moving, that one's not moving. Let's just use the dissolved station again. It's better if you use the dissolved station because you're removing the solder. There we go, it's come out. So it really is that simple, as you can see. But if you don't cut it into pieces like that, when it's this badly damaged, I mean look here, you can see, you know, this isn't something I've done, this is when it was originally removed. We've got pants missing on this side as well. Um, but you can add to the problem there if you know the you know let's say you're not be able to remove solder from this side because the pads are missing on the other side. Yeah, this is going to be a nightmare. This is the bit that's going to make this hard. You might think it's that. That's going to be a doddle, an absolute doddle to do that. So I'll have a close up of both sides of this in a minute. I'll just point out what I think is an issue and what isn't an issue. I think what I'm going to do is split this over a number of videos because otherwise the video is going to get too long. So it's taken about two hours to get to this point of the board actually, so you can see just a bit of corrosion around here, but that looks okay. Um, again, corrosion around there, that looks okay. Pad missing. Here we've got uh, corrosion again, I need to check obviously, we've got a connection to the resistor pack there. Pad missing, that's okay. Pad missing, trace missing. The trace was lifted. And this isn't something I'd done, you know, you can tell the pad was already gone. There was a bodge wire there joining the bit of the trace that was there to the chip, you know, well, to the socket. Um, so it was floating from here, so I've cut it off. There's no point in it even being there. It just goes to, I think, one of the wires over this side here. That was where the wire, there was like a, a wire soldered across the, the trace, actually. So, um, yeah, it was the green wire. So we can uh, deal with that again. And it's like I say, all you've got to do is just work out where it goes to, you know, so you follow it through to the other side here. It goes to that, that wire there. On the underside of the board, when you put the socket on, you know, afterwards, just solder a wire from there to that wire. It's nice and tidy, the top of the board will be presentable, you know, no problems at all. So again, some dirt and corrosion around there. Um, that looks okay, that looks all right. Yeah, some damage around here, need to inspect and stuff, but for the most part, they're okay. There's a bit of corrosion or something on the top side of that pin. There, okay here, missing pad, I think. Um, most of these are all right. There were some fixed wires between the pins on the top side here, I've removed them now, and these here. But again, this is super easy to fix on the underside. As soon as you, you know, you know you've got some issues with these, all you've got to do on the underside is just measure to the wire that goes straight to it. These just go straight across, so that's super easy to test and fix those afterwards. It changes a bit over here, because I think one of these, this here was joined here. And can you see, I think that was a mistake. There was a fixed wire there. That was a mistake because it looks to me like it comes down there like that around here. So the fixed wire that was on there that I removed was incorrect. Um, and this one looks like it comes diagonally to that one. That did have a fixed, uh, no it didn't have a fixed wire that one. Or did it? I can't remember now. I think it might have done just here. Um, yeah, but those all look okay. So yeah, I suspect what's happened here, it's not the corrosion that's done all this. It's just a bad removal. Someone's removed it and forced the thing off when a lot of the solder's not being removed and stuff. Um, so yeah, you know, my technique there of cutting the socket up, had they done that, they perhaps could have avoided uh, this damage here, although they wouldn't have needed to cut it off, because I think most of the solder points around here would have been okay. But then again, there could have been some corrosion on some of these, and that might have been the problem. But cutting it off and pulling it off in little chunks like that, they could have removed, the, or, you know, a they could have avoided the damage uh, there, removing that. And it's a similar horror story on the side, you can see pad missing, pad missing, some of these here, that one's just about there, you can see, you know, I don't know if you can see that, it's got a metallic edge, if you scraped around it, you could reuse that, 
can get a connection on there, I'm sure. But I mean, it could be that it's gone. I'm seeing the brown colour that leaves behind where the pad, you know, the silhouette was on the pad. Pad missing, pad missing, a little nick there, and check that. Half a pad missing, half a pad missing, I think. Um, yeah, SMP, half a pad missing, pad missing. So yeah, I just need to just thoroughly inspect that when we come to the next part. You can see there, that's one of those veins, you know, these are the ones where they go up like that, and it's just like, say, one of the end ones that kind of goes at an angle or something somewhere. So yeah, that blob there is because there was a wire in that one there, and there was a, wire, a few wires in those actually. Yeah, not really sure what's gone on here, you know, this look, well, I do know the battery, but in terms of remedial work, you know, there's a diode here with a weird bent leg, that could have been factory, but still it looks a bit odd, and we've got something missing from here, and a bit of a leg there, there's a bit of a leg here. So I think we'll get the Agnes socket off here next before I wrap this video up. Again, we'll just go around this with the desolder station, actually. I think the last time I did one of these, I just used a solder sucker and my 15 watt iron, but it's obviously far easier doing it this way. Although the tip size is going to cause me some interesting problems here as I end up putting solder onto the pins I've previously desoldered. Anyway, I'll show you once I've made some more progress. So I've got all the solder off there, we'll do a similar thing now where we just uh, grab three pins and pivot, go around every single uh, pin, make sure they're all snapped off as possible, and then if we're super lucky the socket might just come off with literally no leverage at all. And if you gently hold and pull the socket from the other side, uh, just as you do a bit of this, you can actually feel it start to come off actually, I can feel it moving. It's coming off on one side, super easy. There's a bit of resistance up, there's a bit of resistance up here on this side, so again, like I say, I'm just pulling gently from the other side. Grab two or three pins at once, and just pivot like that until you hear it snap. Just gently, what we're trying to do here is avoid scratching or marking the board and just snap them off on both sides. And there we go, I was hoping to show you that but it just came straight off, no damage at all. Just from, uh, let's say, pulling it slightly from this side as I, you know, uh, squeezed the pins on the other side, no damage whatsoever there. So a bit of extra solder there, can you see that on that ground point? Um, but yeah, that's it, no damage. And our socket has come off in one piece, other than the one pin that came out on one uh, one of the bits, you know, the corners that were chipped off. There you go, so I removed some of the solder from here, it looks like there's still a bit inside the hole there, but as you can see, no damage at all. So this is the board we showed in part one actually, and just to clarify some things, things with Agnes, this is an 8372A. I think this came into use on this board actually, this is a 6A, but I think it came in around Rev 6, uh, I think there might be a 6B, I'm not sure, um, and in the Amiga 2000. So it can address one mega chip, but as I mentioned in the previous video, the older Agnes was a dip chip, kind of like this, 40, same size actually, 48 pin. Uh, now that was in the Amiga 1000, and you had an NTSC version and a PAL version. The NTSC one was this, uh, the PAL one was the 8367. The NTSC chip was the 8361. So you know that can cause you some interesting problems if you're trying to locate spares for an A1000. You need to get the Agnes for you know the right region there. And it was the same thing with the early 500 Agnes, actually. But actually, at that point, they called it Fat Agnes. This is where the fat came in. As soon as it was a square package, they went, oh, let's call it Fat Agnes. Um, so, you know, functionality-wise, it's probably the same as the one in the 1000, because this can only address half a meg of chip. Um, you can see upside down there, 8371. But this doesn't have the NTSC PAL jumper. So the 8371 is the PAL version of this. There's an 8370 which is the NTSC version, and I think that was up to Rev 5 boards. This is a Rev 5 board, actually, but we'll cover this in a future video. So this Agnes is referred to the OCS Agnes. You'll see that a lot within the Amiga scene. You'll see OCS, ECS, AGA, and it might perplex you to start, but it really is simple. The OCS stands for Original Chipset. 
and typically that will be paired with a straight 8362R8, you know, the original Denise. This is what they call the OCS Denise. Now, I haven't had the privilege to look at a 600 yet on my channel, but from what I understand, the 600 was, um, the, I think, probably the second model to make use of the ECS, you know, the enhanced chipset. Um, and that would have shipped with probably something like this, actually, I think a 608375. Uh, but I think the first board this came in to use with was the, with the 500 plus, actually. So this could address 2 meg of chip. Uh, now, I'm not 100% sure on this. I, I just vaguely remember that there are certain revisions of this um, 8375 that were kind of limited to 1 meg. This might be the 1 meg one, because I've just got recollections when I got my 500 plus of swapping out this 8375 to, uh, for a different 8375. You'll see, you can see like a, a, another Commodore part number there with Dash 01. There's lots, uh, several, I think, different revisions of this. Most of them, I think, are 2 meg, but I think there might be a 1 meg ver ver version. Please post in the comments below if you know more about that. I'm just going off memory. But typically, as I say, the A375, you'll find it on 500 plus, and I think it was in use on 600 motherboards. And the interesting thing with this is, uh, as I mentioned before, I think, uh, it's, the, it's got the NTSC PAL uh, pin somewhere, somewhere up here, I think, I could be wrong. Um, and that pin, you know, depending on whether you put a high or low or high impedance, nothing at all, because I think it might have a pull down or a pull up on it itself, you can toggle between NTSC and PAL. To get true NTSC or PAL, you would need to obviously change the main crystal, probably, I would think. Um, it could cause you some interesting issues with uh, colour and things like that, but then again, this, I don't think there's a, a colour burst signal generated on this board, you'd need the modular unit to do that, so I think you'd probably be okay. But thinking back to when I uh, swapped the chip out in my 500 plus, um, and in fact thinking about it, my 500 plus might have had a different chip altogether, it could have been an 8372A, it might be a case if you can swap this for the 8372A, again please post in the comments below, because I remember having to do uh, a mod there to stick um, a piece of insulation tape up the side of the pin to isolate it from the, you know, the carrier edge here, the socket edge, in order that it would be identified as PAL. Uh, and the clue with that, if you ever try that, you know, and you're wondering what's going on. You've swapped the Agnes for the, you know, the 8375 here, and the system's booting, but sound sounds strange, and you're getting just odd, strange things going on. It's probably that jumper because that's what I was finding. I found sound was at the wrong frequency. As soon as I changed, you know, isolate that pin and uh, tried it without the pin connection to the uh, edge of the socket there, it was behaving totally normal as it should do. And some people refer to the 2 meg version as the obese Agnes. I mean, it's still marked as fat Agnes on the board, but yeah, that's uh, yeah, if you ever see obese Agnes, people are talking about the 2 meg version. There was actually a 4 meg version that was in development, I think, but yeah, that never came to see light of day. So the other thing you had on the 500 plus and the 600 as part of that ECS chipset was an ECS uh, Denise here. You can see this is an 8373R4. So it just allowed higher resolutions and higher colour depth, I think, in, in certain resolutions. So just coming back to the 8372A here, there is an 8372 without the A. I think it's identical. If you search the wikis and things, you'll find that there is reference to an 8372 and there's no information about it. Nobody knows much about it. But I have seen an 8372 myself, I think, in these boards and it just behaves and works the same as far as I understand. Now this is the point where things get a little bit confusing because as we, we talked about the 2 meg version being the 8375 there, but some of these 8372s will address 2 meg as far as I understand. You can get an 8372AB which would have shipped on an Amiga 3000 um, and again that's, you, know, you can switch between NTSC and PAL on one of the pins there, There's, you know, there isn't a separate version for the different uh, regions there. You've also got the 8372B Again, that would have shipped in an Amiga 3000. I'm guessing those you could probably fit those on here. I'm not entirely sure because the pinouts do vary subtly between the different chips, just a little bit. Um, some of them are interchangeable, some of them aren't. The other thing you can do is you can chop and change some, some of the parts. You know, uh, I mean, obviously Agnes. Yeah, you, it depends what uh, pit pin profile you've got around there, so which Agnes's you can put in it. You can't just put any old Agnes in. But um, say with super, the Super Denise here, for example, on this 500 plus, you could swap that out and just put a Denise in there, and it will work. The only thing you've not got is the ECS graphics modes 
there. But the system will boot fine, you can play your games, you just won't be able to play anything that makes use of uh, ECS uh, graphics modes there. Uh, and it's the similar sort of thing with the uh, Kickstart down here. This board at the moment I've been testing, I think just now it's got a 1.2 uh, version of Kickstart and it will work, it will boot that way, despite the fact it's got an ECS um, Denise here and it's got the 2 meg ECS um, Agnes here, you know, Fat Agnes here. So in terms of diagnosing faults on a 500 plus, if you've got a 500, you can use the parts from that to help diagnose what's going on. Um, it's just the Fat Agnes that you might run into some issues with. Just to clarify, and I think I could be wrong, again post in the comments below if you know otherwise, but with this 8371 here, the original one that's half meg of chip, you know, that's a little address, you can swap this for an 8372A. This is only a Rev5 board here, but in theory I think it works, and that's where you've got to isolate the pin up here with the, you know, the, the NCC PAL pin. Um, Otherwise your sound frequency is too fast and stuff, as I mentioned earlier. So yeah, that's what I was thinking of there. So we get the socket on there now, you can see pin 1 marking is here. And inside the socket, can you see this little arrow here? That's pin 1 and there's a chamfered edge up here. Um, so you just need to just carefully get that in position. There we go. Flip it over. Just inspect. Just inspect, make sure all the pins are through, you've not got any bent pins or anything. And uh, you know, anchor a corner points. Make sure it's flat, make sure it's flat and in the right position and stuff, and then commit to soldering the other points. There we go, five minutes later, soldering done, so I just need to clean off the flux. So I used cotton buds initially, but then we'll just get some IPA on there and uh, just give it a bit of a brush like this, all different directions. Pour some IPA on there, tilt the board at an angle and brush it down. And that should get rid of any contamination from around there. It's looking good already there. And the nice thing is Agnes has got a new home now. There's a lot to do in the next part. Um, I hope you found the video interesting. Please like, share and subscribe and I'll catch you in the next video.